بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ladies and gentlemen uh, good afternoon uh, it's an honor be, uh, and, and privilege uh, to be the moderator of today's session with four distinguished uh, in fact key speakers and we thank you really for being able to uh, as well attend uh, and before I start I just wanted to reflect uh, on two things, uh, one on the first session uh, of uh, this big event that we have attended two days ago, uh, and, and today's as well uh, inauguration of the Qatar uh, per uh, gas to liquid GTL. Uh, I was very, very much uh, impressed and pleased to hear that uh, the key uh, speakers then had highlighted, in fact, very much what we've been, in fact, as well, uh, trying to address. They were talking about the quality of education, uh, the networking, the communication aspects, and how to integrate things. And in today's uh, event uh, of the inauguration of Qatar uh, per uh, Qatar to liquid uh, as well, it has highlighted very interesting aspects to this uh, particular workshop. Uh, in fact, they've talked a lot about what could spin off uh, from this particular uh, GTL, gas to liquid uh, mega project. There could be a lot of research and development that could be hopefully uh, studied, reviewed, analyzed by scientists, researchers, and so on and then applied, be it locally or regionally or internationally. So we found, uh, in fact, the two uh, examples that I've cited very much relevant to uh, what we've been, in fact, trying to pursue. As you, uh, I think most of you know that uh, Qatar has uh, already launched its uh, vision, and to pursue this vision, we've realized uh, that uh, there has to be uh, a driving force, and the driving force is the national development strategy. And I'm glad uh, and happy to say that uh, we have a key components under the economic and the diversification aspect, the R&D, and the R&D is going to play a major role, in fact, uh, in this. And this is a clear sign that Qatar is moving towards uh, its commitment one, uh, yes, we have allocated uh, a 2.8% uh, of our GDP towards the R&D and the funding of the R&D. Uh, that's one aspect, but to see it on the ground, I think the infrastructure has already been established. We have a full-fledged uh, organization, and they are restructuring and, and putting together, hopefully, their strategy that hopefully will be uh, in line with the uh, overall framework of the national uh, vision. So this is something uh, I would uh, like to stress that uh, Qatar and its uh, hopefully uh, plan to develop a more sustainable uh, growth economy, uh, we think or we value the, the R&D aspects and we think the R&D is going to be the cornerstone and the linkage between basically uh, the future growth and how we can link it to the human development in, 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 in a big way. Uh, let alone, for instance, the hosting of 2022. I think hosting even the 2022 is going to bring about uh, interesting, not only uh, raising the capabilities of the country uh, or the nation as a whole, but it will also have hopefully uh, an interesting dimension to the R&D in the future, because there will be a lot of, uh, of course, uh, research and studies, small medium enterprises and other that can have a big bearing on this. And in fact, to complement uh, as well this, uh, we and Qatar Statistics Authority, in collaboration with the Qatar Foundation Research and Development and the UNESCO, UNESCO Institution of uh, Statistics, or Forest Statistics, are planning uh, to conduct uh, an extensive survey in the R&D. And this will bring, in fact, uh, uh, what's this session all about? We have uh, four key distinguished speakers, as I've said. 
They will be talking about the input uh, of R&D and, and the output uh, and its impact. And I think that's what matters, the impact and how, how we could go about uh, realizing this impact. And there will be another presentation uh, on as well the experience in the Arab world, uh, be it uh, lessons learned or, or things that we could maybe consider for the future and also measuring the R&D in, in general. So uh, with this background, uh, I'd like to also say uh, that, uh, that hopefully the overall event will reflect on the national development strategy on a big way. And what matters to us is how we're going to go about integrating it and putting it together in terms of its application. Uh, now I'd like to introduce the first uh, speaker. Uh, professor Michael, he is a professor uh, at the University of Stellenbosch uh, at Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, his presentation is entitled The Measurement of R&D and Its Relevance in Innovation Policy. In his presentation, uh, he will focus on the role of innovation is to play uh, in enabling Qatar to make uh, the transition from a, fac a factor-driven economy to a knowledge-based economy. This is something that I have also missed in my brief, but uh, Qatar has been uh, referring a lot on the knowledge-based society, and this is exactly what we are trying, uh, in fact, all as a nation, to move into this uh, uh, transformation or transition from where we are today to hopefully to a more knowledge-based economy. So with this, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Michael uh, Khan. Uh, professor, that you have only 15 minutes. I shall do my best. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Um, excellencies, uh, colleagues, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak to you in Qatar. It's my first visit to the country, and like many others, I'm very impressed. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and I shall do my best to stick to the time limits. Uh, I'm talking about uh, the measurement of R&D, uh, outcomes and relevance to innovation policy uh, with the stress that if you wish to develop an innovation policy and manage it, you need to know what is going on in your system. So I want to start with um, measurement, the measurement of R&D, a little history, because what I'm doing in a sense is to set the scene for the expert colleagues that come after me. Uh, measuring R&D goes back 70, 80 years to the 1930s. Uh, R&D in warfare, of course, was very, very important in the Second World War. And immediately uh, in its closing stages, the advisor to then President Truman came out with a very famous dictum. He produced a report entitled Science, the Endless Frontier. And in it, he stated very clearly that new products and processes depended on new principles and new conceptions, which in turn result from basic scientific research. And that set the stage for what is still called the linear model of innovation. If you fund basic research, eventually, somewhere in the future, out will come products and processes that add economic value. This, this idea was given added emphasis by the economists in their theories of economic growth, studying the production function, and notably the Nobel laureate Robert Solow showed that it was impossible to account for anything up to 70% of American economic growth if you simply looked at labor and capital productivity. There was something left over, he called it the residual, and he attributed the residual to technological change for which you might substitute the phrase R&D. That, if you like, confirmed the Bush idea. Bush's practical experience was now confirmed in theory which is the way economists like to work. It suited the big science agenda of the Cold War era, and things moved along quite nicely. 
1963, the young OECD commissioned a process to systematize the measurement of R&D, and my colleague, Dr. Ahmad Hussain, will talk to you in detail about what that entails. Now we come into the 70s, a turbulent period, the American economy facing difficulties, funding the Vietnam War, the various oil shocks and oil crises, the rise of importance of the Chicago School of Economic Thinking, Thatcher and Reagan's revolution, the lean state, and the emphasis on value for money. But all along, there was something happening in another country called Japan that was surging ahead. Europe was in stagflation, stagnation with inflation. America the same, but Japan was flying. It's a little bit like today. Okay. Uh, it's a little bit like today when the East, uh, namely Korea and China, is flying and Europe and America are stagnating. Studies were carried out to try and understand better what was going on. And what came back was the notion that this linear model didn't seem to work in Japan. Instead, what was happening there was a much more concerted effort involving uh, government, the financial system, universities, and business. It was more coordinated, and the coordinating agency, somebody would know, was MITI. And these ideas came back to the West and turned into what we call the innovation systems approach. Now, what are innovations? I simply put together a few images to uh, illustrate. Uh, the top, top left one, of course, is the first mobile phone, a brick. Uh, on the right is an accident called Viagra. Viagra did not come out of deliberate research. It was purely accidental observations by medical practitioners of their male patients who had circulatory disorders. Uh, the light bulb, Edison's light bulb, very deliberate hard work, 1,000 attempts to find the right filament. And then on the bottom right from my country, South Africa, 20 years of agricultural research to give you new varieties of proteas. These are all innovations because they get disseminated into markets. So let me move to the definition of innovation. The introduction into a market or an organization of a new or significantly improved product or service. It's got to be new. It's got to be disseminated. The example I gave at yesterday's workshop was a plastic bottle of water. Innovation activities are varied. One of the innovation activities, and that's the point of this section of my talk, only one of them is R&D. You can produce innovations without R&D. You reorganize your business. You do things better and more productively. That's an innovation. There's no R&D involved. You borrow ideas from your competitor. You don't do the R&D. They do the R&D. Most firms in most countries do not do R&D. It's around 5% of firms do R&D. The rest get their ideas from somewhere else. So innovation involves many activities. And the primary activity is the sharing of knowledge, knowledge exchange. Some of it is knowledge generation. I mentioned that already. There are other forms of exchange through codified knowledge, publications, plant varieties, copyrights, and so on. And then there are techniques for knowledge absorption, training your staff, engineering, design capability, and skills generation. And lastly, you've got to understand your market. Those who were with me yesterday will recall this diagram, the newcomers in the room, so let me spend just a couple of seconds on this. In the innovation system idea, the important, uh, the important thing to realize is that there are three major actors. Universities are but one. This conference has a very strong emphasis on universities. There are government research labs in green, and then there's business itself, the business sector. And all of this is functioning in a very much larger sea of national regulations, national culture, external influences, and depends also on the availability of an effective services background. You have that in Qatar. Um, the role of state-owned enterprises if you're going to be putting things in the market, you need a standards authority, and so on. The point is, if you focus only on one of these, you are missing out. Your policy, your innovation policy, has to look at all three synergistically. 
Now, how do we measure and what do we measure? One of the things we measure are the inputs to R&D. Dr. Hussain will talk to you about that. The Statistics Authority, of course, is already measuring education statistics, labor force statistics, and so on. Then there are the outputs. I've mentioned those briefly, publications, patents, and plant varieties, and other outcomes through innovation surveys, which are very much more complicated uh, instruments, and we're not going to deal with that today. Cost-benefit studies on the value of your research, counterfactuals to see what would have happened if you didn't do the research, outcome and impact evaluations, the stuff of the social sciences, and then measurement of networks, the effectiveness of networks. This conference is talking about globalization of research, and it's all about networks. And the evidence for the networks come in co-publications and co-invention citations in patent analysis. The R&D surveys are easy to interpret. You get very clear numbers, you can use them to set national goals. I believe Qatar has set the goal of attaining 2.8% of GDP being spent on R&D. In Europe, they set the agenda of 3%. They didn't reach it, and they will not reach it. And many countries in Europe are still running along at around 2%. By focusing on R&D, it looks indeed as if we're going back to the linear model. And in a sense, the linear model has refused to die. It's very easy to understand. Politicians love it. Put money into research, out comes a product. The popular media emphasize the linear model. They show you a scientist, usually a man, wearing glasses, wearing a laboratory coat, doing R&D. That's the image of innovation. There's a big confusion between innovation and invention. Research is research, invention is something else, and innovation is something else again. I want to just sidestep and talk a little bit about a country that's frequently used uh, as an exemplar. This is a rather complicated diagram, but let me explain. This is Korea between 1964 and 2004. The important message of this uh, graphic is that in 1964, if you look at the blue column, that was the percentage of R&D being done by the state. And you will see, as the uh, economy expands, I haven't put on GDP growth, the share of state spending on R&D declines, and it is substituted by spending by the private sector in yellow. Eventually, when they are almost equal, the expenditure, the ratio, that's the uh, red curve, the ratio of uh, R&D to GDP attains 1%, and then it flies. And what it says to you is that in the early stages of industrialization in Korea, R&D was not very important. But as Korea moved from capital goods production, ships, big things, things that hurt you when they fall on your foot, and they moved into TVs and semiconductors, knowledge became very important, knowledge-intensive industry and therefore R&D became important. The ex increase in expenditure on R&D, I don't think came about because of a government decree. It came about because of necessity. For the firms to compete in the global world, they had to produce goods that were at the technological frontier. I think I'm running out of time, so I want to skip that one. Qatar, one way that Qatar has been measured so far is through the Global Competitiveness Index. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Um, Qatar has an excellent macroeconomic environment, which is the third pillar, uh, factor eight. And its education system, its health care, are among the best 20 in the world. If you look at pillar four, it's ranked 15. But when you drop down there to innovation, Qatar is listed at rank uh, 23. And we can look at that in some little bit more detail. You'll see one of those factors, government procurement of technological products, is very high. But when it comes to capacity for innovation, the assessment that has been made by industry active in Qatar puts the country relatively low. Quality of scientific institutions high, companies spending on R&D relatively low. So there is work to be done here in two ways. Number one, we need to be sure that these numbers make sense. And that's the job of the R&D survey. And secondly, 
we want to know what actions are needed to boost this performance. One of the measures that is not conventionally carried out through an R&D survey is to look at your publications. Uh, I had hoped to attend a session this morning on publications, but I was in the wrong room. Doesn't matter. Con uh, conventionally, publications are measured using two databases. There is more recently the SCOTUS database, and there is the old gold standard of the Institute for Scientific Information, which is now known as Web of Science. And this here is what you will get if you query that database for Qatar, an address in Qatar, a researcher who gives a Qatari address for the period of 2007 to 2010. In that period, it's something like 1,300 publications, and they're distributed according to the subject areas that you can see on the screen. The, the most intensive area, engineering and physics. Sports science is very high. And then you get general and internal medicine. And if you look down the list, you'll see medicine appearing, or medical and health sciences appearing in many places, infectious diseases at the bottom, pharmacology, public health, endocrinology, obstetrics, and so on. And I'm drawing your attention to the fact that there is a lot of health sciences going on. And we heard a lot about that. And of course, you have your to be biomedical research center. So let's have a look what else you can learn from this database. And the next one shows you where the research is taking place and with whom. Uh, it turns out that Hamad Medical Corporation and the hospital, that it's uh, the hospitals that are part of that uh, network, are the site of most of the publications, which is why I emphasize the health research. After that, you get Qatar University, Texas A&M, meaning the US side, and then Texas A&M, Qatar, and so on. So it gives you a sense of the extent of globalization or internationalization of the research efforts. And if you've not seen it before, perhaps there are other things you'd like to comment on when we go to discussion. One more minute. Uh, nearly there. In conclusion, um, to develop research and innovation policy, you have to think right across the economy. If your education system isn't singing, if you have problems with the mobility of staff, if you have restrictive immigration requirements, you can't bring in people when you need them, your innovation system will not function optimally. And I think that is where I must end. Thank you, and shukran. Thank you, Professor uh, Khan, uh, for I think a very stimulating uh, brief or presentation. It's obviously had uh, covered the emergence of innovation systems, the experiences of other places, uh, the definitions uh, of innovation, and, and it's not just simply the R&D. It goes much beyond the R&D. So it's, it's something that I think we, we need to address also from our end. Uh, and and uh, how Qatar uh, is being positioned in the R&D, where are the areas that we needed maybe uh, to address uh, and, and to focus around. And this is why, for instance, the survey that we intend to conduct will provide a, a more uh, an evidence-based, uh, hopefully, uh, outcome or results for policy making, for decision making, and, and for even for planning purposes. Now, the second presenter is Dr. Ahmed Hussain, who is the, an expert in Qatar Statistics uh, Authority. He will uh, be presenting to us uh, and measuring the R&D inputs, personnel and expenditure. And he will focus on the input indicator for measuring uh, or for the measurement of R&D activities at a national level. Dr. Ahmed. Good afternoon. I would like really to thank you for attending uh, this workshop on measuring the research and development outcomes. Uh, uh, I have to mention something before I start my presentation, really, that all the information 
and definitions and conventions in this presentation are based on Frascacci manual prepared by OECD. Frascacci is a villa in Italy where the OECD prepared this manual. We will be using this manual in preparing our R&D survey. So, uh, and I think Frascacci manual is became the Bible of measuring research and development at the international level because really you, uh, the UNESCO Institute for Statistics already adopted this, the, the contents of this uh, manual in order to advise member countries to conduct surveys on R&D, on measuring R&D. So my presentation will focus on the definitions and conven conventions of R&D from statistical perspective, measuring R&D personnel, measuring R&D. So as, as you see, my presentation will focus on the input of the uh, research and development, and my uh, colleague Hatim will focus on the outcome of the uh, research and development. So the definition, the first definition of, from a statistical perspective for R&D, research and experimental development comprise creative work undertaken on a systematic basis in order to increase the stock of knowledge, including knowledge of man, culture, and society, and the use of this stock knowledge to devise new applications. So there are three activities under the research and development. The first one is the basic research. Could be the basic research is a experimental or theoretical action or uh, action taken in order to uh, 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 to gain information but with no particular application or use in view also applied research is targeting collecting or uh, uh, in, in new in new knowledge but really directly primary towards a specific practical aim or objective experimental development is based on the gaining or the available knowledge directly to produce new materials, products, or devices. This is the difference between three. Now, who we are measuring? We are measuring institutions in the area of business enterprises, government, higher education, private, and nonprofit uh, organizations. And we are uh, measuring also the resources coming from abroad now what type of uh, what type of classification used for the science let's say actually we don't have an agreed upon uh, classifications for uh, science and technology uh, as you see here we have six areas identified by unesco in order to work for r and natural sciences engineering and technology medical and health sciences agricultural sciences, social sciences, and humanities. So we are measuring the six areas. Now the classification of socioeconomic objectives. How now the R&D relate to the economy? So as I mentioned, the classification here uh, is really an experience from let's to say advanced member countries, we are using it in research and development uh, surveys in many member countries. So, and I would like really to mention that exploration and exploitation of the earth, the earth and the space environment in the area of transportation, transport, com telecommunication and other infrastructure, energy, industrial production, health, agriculture, education, culture creation, political and social systems, general advancement of knowledge and defense. Let me first go to the personnel. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, I have to focus on two issues. The first one is measuring personnel and measuring the expenditure on R&D. We measure the personnel who are really directly working in R&D, who are working in R&D, researchers, technicians, and equivalent staff other supporting staff. Researchers, professionals engaged in the 
conception of, of creation of a new knowledge, products, processes, methods, and systems, and also in the management of the projects concerned. Include scientific manager, postgraduate students at the PhD level engaged in R&D, and in some member countries like Tunisia, they consider the uh, master's uh, level in, in, in measuring uh, research and development. So technicians, really, who main tasks require technical knowledge, technical experience, and working in the area of research and development. Other supporting staff, like uh, unskilled craftsmen, secretarial, and clerical staff. But really, I have to mention here, should be working directly to serve the R&D research. Measurement, how do we measure the, uh, the personnel working on uh, R&D? The first issue is the head count. Head count are data on total number of persons who are mainly or partially employed on R&D. Head count data are the most appropriate measure for collecting additional information about R&D personnel, such as age, gender, national origin. Then, full-time equivalent. So we have, a, we have let's say, a, a, a professor at the university works, let's say, 70% of his time for teaching and 30% of his time for research. We have a researcher also. He works 70% for uh, research and 30% of his time for teaching. So we have to consider really the part-time uh, uh, and uh, part-time in, uh, in working in research and development. Uh, uh, Full-time equivalent is the true measure of the volume of R&D, really. OK. Here, there are four people who are work four per for researchers who are working in R&D. Full-time, part-time, part-time, part-time uh, as well. 90%, 60%, 40%, 20%. 20 All of them consists uh, as 2.2 uh, full-time equivalent, only 2.2. They are four, but they are equivalent to 2.2 full-time. Then source of the uh, information for the R&D, sometimes we get information from the time use surveys, which we use, which we use to conduct it every from five to six years. Based on researchers' own evaluation of the distribution of their working time. The researchers expressed how many hours they are uh, working for research and development. Based on the estimation of the director, the technical director, the head of the department, also based on our, the coefficients. So uh, these are the sources of information. Measuring now R&D expenditure. Also, uh, intra, uh, intramural expenditure is the main, really, expenditure used in in calculating the expenditure. Also, we are, we are using the current cost and the capital cost are measured, but de depreciation costs are excluded in measuring the uh, expenditure on R&D. R&D expenditure, general issues. Uh, R&D involves significant transfers of resources among units. Units here means the entities, the, the entity of the research and development organization and sector. In particular, between government and other performers, important information for science and policy. That's enough. Measuring R&D expenditure. How do we measure uh, a statistical unit or a statistical sector or a statistical entity have intramural and extramural expenditure on R&D? And as I mentioned, we consider intramural expenditure. Uh, the full procedure for measuring expenditure. First, we have to identify the intramural, then identify the sources of the funds as reported by the performer, aggregate the data by sectors or performer and sources of funds to derive significant national totals. Optional, identify the extramural R&D expenditure of each statistical unit or sector. R&D, now the expenditure from the current costs. Current costs are the labor cost and the related salaries and uh, uh, housing, uh, benefits, whatever. Then other current costs, uh, uh, including the supplies, 
the books, journals, materials from laboratories, costs from on-site consult consultations, administrative and other overhead costs. R&D capital expenditure. Uh, also, we have to consider the capital expenditure like the land and buildings, infra in in instruments or equipments, computer software. So these this, uh, sources of R&D expenditure. We have to follow two criteria in identifying the source of R&D expenditure. There must be a direct transfer of resources. Then the transfer must be both intended and used for performance of R&D, such as a unit gives funds to another in return of equipment, services needed to own R&D. Now, the uni general university funds. We have to consider also the university funds uh, as R&D contracts and grants from governments and another outside sources. University own funds, income from endowments, like let's say uh, if uh, Bill Gates passed away, he will donate to the university for $10 billion in order to work on research and development. Receipts from journal subscriptions, sales of uh, serum or agriculture produce, etc., from university. So that's enough for this. Now, let, let, let me show you this uh, exercise. Now we have here the sources, and then we have the performers. Let's say for the uh, business enterprises, the sources of money to business enterprises comes from abroad, from uh, non-governmental organization, from higher education, from government, from business organization comes to uh, business uh, enterprises. Then also uh, the, uh, the government comes from government, from higher education, from uh, NGOs, from abroad, and etc. The total uh, uh, gross domestic expenditure R&D. Let's say Qatar uh, targeted 2.8 of the GDP. So, okay, GDP, but the the the, the actual funding, uh, I think, could be uh, one uh, one point uh, something from the GDP. Okay, thank you. Dr. Ahmed, uh, I think it was uh, very enlightening to realize that this is a very scientific uh, process and, and uh, even systems that one has to consider while, while uh, proceeding in terms of measuring the R&D. So uh, we appreciate the complexity uh, and, and uh, the implication behind how once, uh, if we decide hopefully to proceed with this, what should be considered. The third now presenter is Professor Hatem uh, Mahani. He is a professor at the High School of Commerce of the University of uh, Lambour at, uh, in Tunisia. In his presentation, he is going to focus on a set of, in, in a set of uh, output and impact indicators that he has been adopted in order to be enabled uh, to tell the story about what has happened uh, when investments in the R&D. So the professor, yes. Thank you, President. Uh, thanks to uh, QSA for uh, the invitation. Uh, at the same time, uh, I have the hardest work, I think, because to talking about uh, outcomes in R&D is surely the, uh, uh, the, um, the most difficult way to uh, apprehend the question of R&D. Um, Okay, my presentation uh, I is structured uh, uh, in five parts. 
uh, first of all, uh, the main challenge, uh, which is uh, uh, the question of uh, transforming R&D in outcomes. And then I will uh, present some uh, uh, output indicators and outcome indicators, the uh, challenges uh, ahead, and uh, uh, two or three uh, uh, conclusions. The, uh, the problem of transformation of R&D to outcomes is uh, emerging, and uh, usually uh, politicians uh, ask uh, about the return on uh, investment of uh, the uh, uh, budget allocated to uh, the R&D. Uh, 1% or 3% is in some cases uh, uh, huge of, uh, uh, huge amount of investment and uh, as an investment we uh, expect some uh, return. And uh, uh, for this uh, we have to give some uh, answer and uh, I have to, uh, to say that uh, uh, the answers in this field in particular uh, aren't so uh, uh, so achieved like in, in the case of uh, inputs. Um, GERDS, the most cherished uh, uh, indicator, is considered as an input and not an output indicator. Even if in some literature we talk about GERD as a uh, uh, an indicator of performance. This is not the case. But we have some uh, information uh, on uh, input uh, on outputs uh, uh, with uh, 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 watching to the number of uh, publication patterns and uh, other uh, indicators like we will see. Uh, and uh, there is a need to examine the relevance of government fund, uh, government funded R&D and the ability to transform applied R&D into public and private sector benefits that are aligned with the national uh, objectives or priorities. There is also uh, 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 an objective to uh, monitor the outcome of uh, innovative activity and essentially uh, uh, to ensure that long-term innovation strategies are uh, successfully adopted. Um, in my presentation, I will talk about at the same time, out, in the same time output indicators and outcome indicators. Uh, there is difference between them. I tend to uh, to uh, uh, to say that uh, output indicators are direct. Uh, indicators of impact and uh, outcome indi uh, indicators are indirect uh, outco uh, outcomes, uh, indirect impact of uh, uh, the R&D uh, activities. Uh, in the case of output indicators, there is some uh, list, there is a list, uh, known list of uh, uh, output indicators uh, they are the number of patents, trademarks, uh, registered design, uh, and uh, other activity. There is, uh, for uh, the field of publication, there is the number of peer-reviewed publication with uh, specialization in particular scientific discipline, the number of uh, citation, relative impact, the H index, etc. Even in this field, there is some improvement, I think, it is uh, interesting to uh, to say a few words on this improvement. Now uh, we not only talking about the number of uh, of uh, patents, but we are talking uh, more uh, about tried patents. Tried patents are uh, patents registered in the same time in USA, um, in Japan, and in Europe. With this kind of uh, specificities with this kinds of uh, element, we enhance the informative uh, and the quality of uh, the um, indicators. We use always uh, uh, 
uh, international uh, uh, registered patents application and uh, with uh, uh, in the form of ratio by a billion GDP. We uh, use now the international patent in PCT uh, uh, applied in uh, uh, some fields or in societal challenges. We use now uh, a number of new trademarks per million uh, population per capita or number of new designs per million of the population. You see that even in the old indicators, there is an effort to ameliorate these uh, indicators. When we talk about publication, we talk more and more about world shares of scientific publication and publication by field of science, the number of citation, self or not, H index, international scientific co-publication, or more precisely, scientific publications among the top 10% most cited publication worldwide as percentage of total scientific, pub scientific publication of the country. And this is more informative indicator. In the case of outcome, we are in a, a new field. This field uh, is a new research field. And I, I must point out that before talking about these indicators, because uh, we can say that there is some experiences in some regions in the world where they try to develop so, uh, uh, such kind of indicators, particularly in Europe and uh, particularly when we look uh, to uh, some uh, statistics of Eurostats. The idea of impact is uh, to have a world leadership improvement and some benefits to citizens. But how to do it? Here we have some uh, kind of indicators, not surely used like the input uh, indicators, but they are used in some regions. For the world leadership, uh, I have four type of uh, indicators to, to propose. Exports of high technology products as a share of total exports. Knowledge intensive services exports as percentage of total services export. Technology balance of payments and license and patent revenues from abroad as percentage of GDP. For the production of these indicators, we have no, uh, we have not to uh, use R&D or innovation survey. This, these indicators are possible, the production of these indicators are possible in the national uh, statistic uh, agencies. In the economic department, you can have the most of this information. For local improvement, there is some uh, indicators emerging now, like firms having introduced a product or a process innovation as percentage of all firms, sales of new to market products, percentage of turnover, sales of new to firm products, percentage of turnover, and impact of process innovation on costs, reduced labor costs, or reduced use of materials and energy. For these indicators, we must have an innovation survey. We must do an innovation survey. When we talk about outcome as broader com concepts, we can have many fields. I choose two fields, employment and environment. We have some indication in this case too employment in high tech services as a percentage of total workforce. The list of high tech services exists. It is disponible. We can find it in the OECD document. Employment in medium high and high tech manufacturing as a percentage of total workforce. 
the list of medium high and high tech manufacturing are given by OECD documents. Here, uh, we can have these information from the National Statistic Agency too. When we talk about environment innovation, we must use the survey or some kind of uh, department in the environmental uh, ministry. Uh, there is some improved and uh, uh, changes in the organizi uh, organizational method and marketing method to create environmental benefits compared to alternatives. And this is uh, uh, ways to find uh, outcomes. Benefits to citizens could be uh, found in, the pro in productivity in calculating the productivity. The residual of solo uh, is here. We can produce more going to A to B with the same number of quantity, uh, the same quantity of labor. How? By improving productivity. The case of United States period 87 to 2010. The growth is 2.9. Combined input growth is 1.8. One point is missing. The third of the growth is missing. The third of the growth is partly explained by is a residual, but one or two of the determinants could be innovation and R&D. The question is to work on this residual and to tend, yes, to find the reason why we have third of the growth not explained. Challenges ahead. In the last five years, I give you some documents, some work done in the case of outcomes indicators. First, U.S. Congress, document for the U.S. Congress, developing a process for using metrics to assess the impact. NSF 2006, to develop the foundation of an evidence-based platform, etc., and predict its outcome, not achieved. OECD Innovation Strategy 2006, will include a framework for dialogue and review New indicators on the innovation economic performance link. U.S. Department of Commerce, 2008, Measuring Innovation, Committee on Measuring Innovation. To develop new improved, third, how it affects economic growth. My conclusion, um, there is a growing and booming political interest. It was said. Uh, there is problem to apprehend the question of outcome. More precisely, we have to move from what can we say with the measurements we have towards a qualified development of new measures that can measure what we really want to know. And we have to develop what, we, what I call the non-economic impacts is issues, short list of non-economic impact issues. Social implication, engagement with association, working on scientific question, law, ethics, new, ju new jurisprudence, standardization, new standards, intellectual skills, development of new skills, creativity, critic, analysis, and synthesis. This is the real outcome, and we don't know how to capture all these issues. Thank you, Professor Hatem. It was very enlightening, uh, I think, presentation. And you are very right in saying that uh, it gets more challenging and complex uh, when it comes to the output, not just simply the output, but really the outcome and its impact, and how the impact can be linked 
to, to the various, uh, in fact, aspects of, of uh, other uh, uh, dimensions like, you know, economic, social, and other. Uh, and it's not easy really to put it or to, uh, to capture the whole thing together. Uh, but obviously the patent aspects to it has, has uh, also a very interesting uh, dimension to it. Uh, now I'd like to uh, introduce the, uh, uh, the last but, but, but uh, by far the least, uh, the fourth presenter, uh, Professor Nabil uh, Saleh. He is a professor at the National Research Center of Egypt in his presentation entitled uh, The Challenges of Measuring R&D in the Arab Region. Uh, Professor uh, Saleh will focus on the role of science and technology indicators in developing, uh, ev developing evidence-based innovation strategies. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, when we talk about challenges of measuring R&D in the Arab region, it's one of the most difficult areas because we begin to talk about uh, the positives and the negatives and wh why aren't we getting that much data out? Let's look at the positive side and the negative side. From the negative point of view, we have a lack of science and technology policies, and I'm talking in a very general aspect because you can come up back, everyone will come up and say, oh, we have this and that. But I'm talking about the overall national science and technology policies. There's a lack of coordination on a national level. In other words, you have activities all over, but there's no national body that is collecting all of the data together quality of the data, how reliable is the data, individuals ver versus systems. We get a lot of individuals working around, but there's no system. It's a, complete, it's a repetition of the, uh, the, first, the second one. Industries are unaware of the potentials of research development and innovation. What are the positive sides? The data is present. If you go into any country and try to dig it out, you'll find it all over the place. Growing awareness of an application of IT. Some countries are developing science and technology, including their research and development systems, but they're not complete yet. Several countries have sectoral policies, field of agriculture, environment, but still, they're not all under one big national umbrella. Several regional international organizations are willing to help. What's, what's the present position of research and development indicators in the Arab region? This is the availability of research and development statistics as collected by the UNESCO Institute of Stat uh, Statistics. And you can see that only five countries out of eight responded in the Arab states, in the, in the African Arab states, three out of 12 in the rest of the Arab countries. And that's a very low response. This, we, we, we carried out two studies, 2006 and 2008. At the first, in the first study, we had 17 countries and in the second one, we had the total 22. If you look at the table, you'll see that most of the answers that we're getting from collection, collected de data, that is, is in the higher education. But when you get down to research and development, it's much lower than that. Th there's a discrepancy between the 200 and 2008 and the 2006. Five countries that took place in the first survey didn't respond in the second one. And we got three in three additional uh, cases, uh, countries in the, in, the, in the 2008. So there's 
there's no consistency. What was said concerning R&D in the Arab countries? I, I collected a couple of quotations from some of our eminent people working in, in the field. And there's a program known as ESTEAM in the middle, in the Mediterranean. It includes Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Palestine. Egypt didn't really take part in this one. The comment is, much remains to be completed, consolidated, and validated. So we're still missing parts all over. Given the fluidity of large numbers of contractual part-timers, part in other words, in most of the universities, especially between private universities and governmental universities, you're getting the people working part-time here and when you come to count them, you can get double counts because they should be counted once under their original university. Confusion between what budgets do you have for science and technology and research and development. As was mentioned earlier, there's a system, but no one follows it. R&D indicators alone cannot fully explain the characteristics of R&D development. We heard the previous uh, speakers give us the same impression. The dynamics of R&D system, R&D practices, informal behavior, contributions, as well as unexpected changes, just to mention a few. And then we come to a very sensitive area. When as much as 90% of the country's scientific production measured in number of publications are co-signed with foreign co-authors. How do you differentiate between what is national science belonging to the country and what is what belongs to the foreign side? Do we know anything about uh, intellectual property? Do we sign these agreements beforehand when you're doing the research so that each one knows his institution's right and his personal right. Lessons to be learned. About a couple of months ago, we had a, a Malaysian scientist gave, giving us a lecture on research and development, lessons to be learned within that area. I just took three, ex some excerpts out. He was talking about knowledge, R&D, and development. Now, I'd like to read some of them out. Knowledge resides in individuals and collectively in society. In other words, individuals on their own don't work together. Creative energy and knowledge networks, he's, that's what he's suggesting, to be the two, one of the major tools to take place in the, f in the dissemination of knowledge creative energy and knowledge networks, collaboration, co-creation, freedom, and democratization. And then it has to be managed. You don't leave everyone to do his own bit here and there. You've got to manage your inputs, the activities, the outputs, the outcomes, the impacts, and lose, simply use a logical framework. In the field of development, we always Misunderstand ICT, it's a big and important tool, but it's not research and development in, in that sense. It's carried out in all of the parent companies. Copying industrial models of the West is a dead end. That's his point of view. And developing countries cannot become producers if they depend only on foreign inputs. We have to build our own models for development. And under the purpose of research and development, peer review journal publication is not a good indicator of usefulness. It's just a figure. It shows that this institute is working stronger, higher, faster than the one, but it doesn't give you the quality of the work within the, uh, the institute. 
or the country to be, to be quite honest. R&D agenda set by developed countries in the West. In other words, we always go there, pick up the, the ideas and come and copy them. It's wrong, we have to develop our own ideas. Urgent problems of developing countries still go unsolved. Now, in the last four or three overheads, I'll just give you a recipe for how do we start and how do we end the whole system? What, where, where do we fill in the gaps? We have to have a solid, viable national science and technology system based on research, development, and innovation. Both science and technology, as was mentioned here, or I think it was mentioned also in the, the opening session, also should include the social sciences. Social sciences are complementary to the science and technology. They, they complete e each other. Building reliable central R&D databases, and that's the critical point that we should, every country should have its own database centrally, collectively, and periodically updated. And it should be based on international standards. We might disagree on the level of standardization, but at least for comparison reason, it should be standardized. We can start our own indicators at one time, but when we have enough knowledge about what we want and what we need, Take into, um, we should take into, um, in, into consideration the gender dimension, science popularization, that's in the education systems, quality assurance, and most importantly, as I, repeat, as I said before, I keep repeating it over and over, intellectually property rights. We should know what belongs to us, what belongs to the other side, and how to give each one his own share. Finally, finally, strengthening R&D and innovation in higher education. It's very poorly represented there. They have ma master degrees, PhD degrees, but that's it. International scientific level of research centers should be inter centers of excellence, technology incubators, and science parks and we should have a solid industrial base, which we lack in most of the Arab countries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nabil. Uh, I think the snapshot that you had uh, provided us uh, definitely highlights some very interesting gaps in the Arab world. Uh, maybe it could be viewed uh, from, from uh, others uh, on or another perspective. It is very discouraging, but I think it should inspire all of us because there are some very interesting lessons learned. Uh, and I think also it re restress uh, what uh, we've highlighted at the very beginning and, uh, in fact, the distinguished uh, speakers have highlighted a similar uh, view on the importance of data, uh, systems, uh, integration, uh, and connectivity on how we should go about it. I, I think the for way forward that you have presented is, is some good food for thoughts, and it could be, I think, uh, a recipe for, for any uh, genuine nation who wants to proceed further with this. Uh, now that we have concluded uh, the four uh, presentations, uh, we'd like now to open the floor for any question and answer of, of maybe 10 minutes or so. Please, your name and, and the question, please.
is there a relationship between impact on disease, say age index and innovation? And my question is motivated by my observation as a department head where there are chemists, there are structural engineers, there are geotechnical engineers, there are biologists, um, that it is very much dependent on the field. If it's a relatively new field, there is a relationship between the impact on the field in general and innovation or the established field is not. So I just want to know what the actual field is. Uh, thank you very much. Good both are very good questions. The alternative to linear model is the innovation systems approach. And it essentially argues that uh, innovation is a nonlinear process, hence the challenge to the linear model, and that it involves intimate interaction primarily with the business sector. And universities in and of themselves are not the site of innovation because they don't engage directly with the market. They're in the business of teaching and research. It's only when a university spins out ideas into a company, and that company itself engages with the market, that the innovations occur. So the alternative model is uh, the innovation system approach. The, the question, you, the second question where you raise uh, index, um, I think that uh, Professor Mhenni will say more about it than, than I will, other than to agree with you that um, certainly citation rates are very discipline specific. We know that in law, you can publish a little thing like that on some interesting case and you get an article. If you're in uh, economics, you've got to do some magnificent thing 30 pages long and spend your whole PhD getting there. So you get one, whereas the legal people might get 10. And in health sciences, it's the same. So yes, there, there is a discipline linked with citations and that will naturally show up in the H index as well. But I would appeal to uh, Professor Mahenny to amplify further. Thank you. I think uh, with this, uh, we would like to conclude. And on behalf of uh, the audience here, we'd like to again to thank the for presenters for a very informative and enlightening, uh, in fact, uh, presentations, which we would hope we could maybe put it together and, and uh, take hopefully the next phase. Thank you again very much.